Okay, so here we are in the offices of Dr. Priscilla Friesen, and we've got one of our teammates hooked up to the neurofeedback equipment. Uh, you can see the electrodes um, on her scalp. Then they are plugged into the computer. And you can, as you, if you look on the computer, you can see a brief readout of her brain waves, uh, basically split up by different categories, alpha, beta, theta, etc. Uh, during the course of this interview, she'll be undergoing the neurofeedback process for her the first time. Uh, could you give us a little bit of history of neurofeedback in general and how this particular type of neurofeedback fits within that? Well, neurofeedback, um, of course, began early, I would say in the 50s, as an extension of the early work on encephalography in the brain. So basically, encephalography is gathering data from the frequencies of the brain activity that is produced underneath the scalp. It is, there are, what, what was er learned early on is that the different frequencies of the brain are related to different states of the brain. So over time, initially they looked at, let's say, what it looked like to be aware or what it looked like, like alpha, for example, was one of the first training states that they were beginning to produce. This was in the, I would say, in the early 60s, kind of back with the hippies, and they were looking to really kind of develop that ability. Um, so that was Joel Camilla back in those earlier days. Technology itself has had a profound impact on, on the, uh, the capability of what has been a, they can now program to, do, to give information to the brain. So over, I would say, the last mm, seven, since maybe 1970, a lot of the focus has been on assisting people with seizures, ADD, obsessional compulsion, chronic pain, more symptom focus to help people do better and to develop an ability to manage more normally. What has happened really in the last 10 years, I would say, particularly with the neurofeedback that I've been using, which is called Zengar Neurooptimal. This was developed by a gentleman, Dr. Valdine Brown. And Dr. Brown is a systems thinker and had early on, back in his earlier uh, history as a, even a computer person and a mathematician, known that the potential eventually was that the brain could get information about itself as a communicating system. This is the only system, the only technology that at this point gives that information. And in addition, this technology has become so much more sophisticated that it can do it, almost, it, can do it automatically. What is it that allows the brain to sort of change in this particular setup as opposed to just getting feedback any other time? Well, actually, I, I wouldn't call it, the brain gets feedback. Like a, one way to think of it would be you get feedback, let's say, with the scales, or looking in a mirror, or, and you alter your functioning in some ways. But that's very, very slow. What's different with this is that it's actually giving you feedback on what's actually happening in the brain. So your brain is always responding and adapting to music, as Jeremy says, but it, it, the, the, the system of the brain is somewhat of a, an internal loop. So it has its own patterns and most of it is not changed. Most of it is not really altered that much by the external environment. Once it's established, your patterns, you kind of move right into your old ditches. Mm -hmm. So what it's doing is giving your brain new data about itself that it can alter. And the brain is very inclined to move towards efficiency. The brain is built for efficiency. So the minute it gets, the second that it gets information about what's efficient, it's a little bit like training wheels on a bike. Once you're, you learn when you're not in balance, the when you learn you're in balance, it's not something you go back to, to trembling or anything, exactly. Uh, in the course of different neurofeedback systems, uh, given the different types of therapies that you've used and the range of patients that you've treated, uh, what are the sorts of uh, potential complications or you know uh, issues that may have been worked through in uh, through these different versions of neurofeedback? 
Well, I think uh, in my earlier experiences with neurofeedback, I think one of the vulnerabilities is that a system can be very reactive. And when you give any feedback, it can kind of over-respond in response to it. And, uh, and sometimes what can happen is that there's even a sense of nausea mm. or a sense of dizziness or, you know, your, sense, your system is sens sensitively balanced. Mm. And if you give it too much feedback, it's going to kind of wobble more than it needs to. Mm. So headaches can be something that I noticed before. It can be, you know, emotional states, mm. irritability, mm. can't sleep that kind of thing. That is really minimized mm -hmm. with this. Mm -hmm. But even with that, when I see people that have uh, physical symptoms, asthma, ulcers, um, some of the symptoms I would call parasympathetic symptoms, that's, that's a little more complicated than I want to get into, but um, there, are slight, there are slight symptoms that can be kind of over shut down systems. Mm -hmm. When you give that feedback, you, you have to be a little bit more gentle with the person to kind of get their balance because they're overreacting to kind of holding in. So I think um, there, whereas most people it's not an issue at all, they do also actually in the system itself, it's built to, uh, it has four different kind of training periods, which is, a, which is important because uh, this is my kind of non-technical way of describing what's happening. In each of these training sessions, a little bit something different is challenged in the brain. So the first one that we did, you're on number three now, or you're, you're on the fourth one, but the first one has to do with kind of just getting your system awakened and kind of ready. The second one is feedback across the hemispheres. So it's really getting a sense of what your brain really does in real time, and it decreases the overreactivity. Zengar 3, which is what I never do the first time, mm -hmm. and I have not done with you, mm -hmm. is to increase the underreacting. Mm -hmm. Now, in people that have had any kind of trauma in their life, that's too active mm -hmm. because they're managing it by shutting it down. So you don't touch that until the brain is a little bit more stable. Mm -hmm. Then the Zengar 4 has to do with kind of an integration of the entire, all the entire training, which is what you're on right now. So, what do you see as uh, the obstacles for, for greater adoption of neurofeedback, not just physically, but kind of within the ethos of the medical and scientific community? And is there research that might help that? Neurofeedback has a lot of scientific data proving that it has an impact. But none of that seems to matter. <laughs> I think what... Um, so in some ways, I think some of the forces that are at play include uh, the pharmaceuticals, it includes the insurance companies, and insurance kind of a, it includes kind of a, a financial structure that this may challenge because it really works. Mm -hmm. And it works in a way that is somewhat effortless and then you don't need it anymore. You don't need drugs anymore. You don't need that thing. So I think that's a, that's, it's a, a tension, economic tension. I think the other thing is that it's a big jump. You know, when I talk to people about neurofeedback, it's hard to understand what is really different mm -hmm. when you become more efficient. Mm -hmm. You think you know what that is, what, you, what that might look like, but that's not really it. Mm -hmm. Because your, brain, your system has never experienced efficiency. Mm -hmm. So to move to that state is something like, in some ways you have to take faith <laughs> that it works mm -hmm. in some ways before you actually do it. And many people are not, can't take that jump. So I think there's that, there's kind of a mindset that this has to be proven, this is, and even when it is proven that it works, it's still hard to kind of make that kind of jump. Mm -hmm. So I think there are a lot of factors that I'm not sure what goes into it all, except that I think, oh, the other thing I think is that there is still a cost. So at this point, and I think Dr. Brown is really moving towards making this much more cost efficient, mm -hmm. when it doesn't take an expert to do it and combine it with what they're doing, and let's say golfers can use it on their own, then it takes it out of the financial structure that includes experts mm -hmm. like me making my, paying my mortgage on it. Mm -hmm. And that's another factor, I think. So there's a professional kind of tension with this. But I think in the long term, this information is gonna be available to everybody.